Please be seated. We're ready to start. A reminder to please put your phones in the silent mode. Families and homilies, a business case. It is often said that those that pray together stay together. Should those that stay together do business together, what if, if any, uh, are the safeguards that need to be in place for such a scenario? Our discussants are Mr. Janmay Jaya Sinha, the chairman of the Boston Consulting Group, India, a BCG fellow and a member of BCG's Henderson Institute Innovation Sounding Board, which is dedicated to supporting, inspiring, and guiding upstream innovation at BCG. He has in the past served as Chairman Asia Pacific for the Boston Consulting Group and on BCG's Executive Committee. Prior to this, he was Managing Director of India Practice, and his areas of specialization include post-merger integration in financial institutions, large-scale transformation, family business strategy, and doing business in India. Mr. Krishna Kumar Natarajan, the former executive uh, chairman and co-founder of Mindtree, who played a key role in building the company's innovative approach to delivering IT services and solutions to Global 2000 enterprises. Mr. Natarajan's areas of expertise include globalization, building large accounts, building great teams and leadership, and at present, he mentors budding entrepreneurs to build scalable and successful businesses. And of course, um, a person who does not need an introduction and who's going to be moderating this penultimate session, Mr. M. Damodaran. Thank you, Rini. I hope all of those who are part, we're discussing families, so if the rest of the family is outside, if you can persuade them to uh, come in, yes. Right. So those who've been uh, a very patient audience since the morning of yesterday and until now, might recall that most of yesterday, independent directors got trashed, auditors got trashed, audit committees got trashed, uh, regulators got trashed, uh, both yesterday and this morning. It did feel a little uncomfortable being an independent director now and a former regulator when in all of 72 years, uh, which is a short life, uh, you've been a regulator for three years and you get judged only on that basis, the other 69 become irrelevant, uh, no matter what you did or did not do. And whenever people talk about regulators in this program, they tend to look in my direction and I was hoping, <laughs> <laughs> and I was hoping Rajiv Agarwal is nearby and Shyamala Gopinath is here, who have had distinguished and longer careers as regulators would be the object of focus. It didn't happen. So today we are going to look at families. Hopefully we will not trash them. But uh, why are families in business? How should they conduct themselves? How do they deal with issues of the aspirations of the second and the third generations? Uh, impatient to get into the driver's seat, what I call the Prince Charles syndrome, the first generation doesn't want to go away. There's not enough space for the next generation, but they're all educated in Harvard or MIT or Yale or whatever. And they say, we have to put this education to good use and therefore we must be in the driver's seat. Conflicts that arise as a result of that. Conflicts that arise because an older generation addressed issues of business. Uh, through, they looked at it through a different lens a little more conservative, a little less inclined to risk-taking, uh, not enough risk diversification in terms of getting into other businesses because they saw getting into other businesses as risk. Do what you're good at doing, what you've always been good at doing. And then you have the next generation saying, I don't think we should be satisfied with this. We should move on to something else. There are structures that have been put around this in India family constitutions, family councils, the, the integration uh, of family and business, see that one doesn't step on the shoes of the other, and yet how do you address the uh, legitimate requirements of the family as well as the business to see that both of them prosper and that the overlap that takes place between families and business does not work to the disadvantage of the business. 
That's the broad picture and there are several variations on that theme that we have seen. But I think Indian corporate experience has been that if the first generation holds together, if there are one or two people, the next generation, the strain start by generation three, they're not talking to each other. And if it doesn't happen in generation three, by generation four, they're filing court cases against each other <laughs> and keeping the judiciary busy. Is that the path through which we should travel? Are there better ways of doing it? And I have two distinguished panelists who've done a lot of work on this, who've thought a lot about families. And I also want KK, as all his friends, including me, know him. I also want KK to touch on promoters that have grown companies, invested not just money and time, but emotions and all of that into growing a company and, uh, and a great company. I had the privilege of looking at this company very, very closely at a point of time a few years ago. And I've said publicly and privately that uh, in terms of value systems, this is arguably the best that I have come across. Thank KK, you. thank you for being here. And maybe some of that is what you will share with them. Janma Jai, who uh, I've known for several years in his original avatar, before he started looking at family businesses closely, uh, he's about to, I think, publish a book, a six-part series has already come out. So this is his current interest. And therefore, what I will do is request him to make an initial statement on what are the broad issues that we should be looking at when we look at families that are in business what are the stresses, the strains? What are the problems? How do you address them? What, what is the big picture that you need to fix? Is there culture that also informs some of these elements? And how important is culture in this entire business? And let's get your opening remarks. And after that, I will come to you. Yeah. So it's always a, a, a privilege to be with Mr. Damodran. And I have learned from past experience that you should be very careful whenever he expresses ignorance, because that means he has got deep insight into something. I think that was even before he became a regulator. I, I remember Some when you saw the cartoons of the guys who asked, am I just making up the numbers? So that I had that feeling when I came up here. <laughs> so I, I still remember when he was a, a joint secretary in, in banking division, actually. I remember going. Uh, to, I had just come back uh, to India and I had gone to get some advice from him. <laughs> he made two comments then, which I still recall with great, uh, uh, with, with, uh, great nostalgia, but also power. One, he talked about, uh, we talked about uh, directed lending. So he said, which kind? The one which is directed by law or the one that is directed by phone? And then after that, and that was a pretty good insight to begin with. And then he said, you know, the biggest problem in the Indian banking system <clears throat> is the absence of, uh, of the least common of the senses, which is common sense. So I, 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 <laughs> I recall that, and I've used that often. But coming to families, you know, the word economy has come from Aristotle's book on Okinamia, which was basically from Greek, which is managing the family. So it's really interesting that the whole concept of the economy originated by looking at families, which were actually the main source of business and uh, economic growth. The interesting thing is that that has not changed. So I have actually got some statistics from just three countries, Germany, Indonesia, and India. You know, 49% of the GDP of Germany is driven by family businesses. 24% of the GDP of India is driven by family businesses. And I'm being inaccurate here because actually 74% of Indian manufacturing is driven by family businesses. But because agriculture, which is also a family business, is not included in my statistics, this number is lower than it could be. So, frankly, it is of ultimate importance for India that family businesses do not fight. Because the time that they destroy the maximum value, not just for themselves, they destroy the least value for themselves, 
but for the entire ecosystem that depends on them is when they fight. Mm -hmm. And unplanned uh, fights, you know, lead to job losses, lead to, you know, supplier dis uh, disruptions, and of course destroy wealth for the family, but that, that's uh, the least of it. But the narrative around families in India has been, uh, you know, persistently negative. You know, in the, both in the media and in, the, uh, in politics, whenever you have an election, you will talk about the families with a negative mindset. And frankly, that doesn't do anything, anyone any favors, because actually family businesses have been fairly robust in, in surviving and also in driving economic growth. Of course, family businesses themselves are of three kinds, you know. And they are all present in India and they are all present abroad and they are in, present in different, uh, to a different extent. So the majority of family businesses in India are owner managers, where they are both owners and managers. Uh, that is quite distinct from how it is in the US, where they are not owner managers. The second group is of activist investors, where they actually sit on the board and actually affect, are very active on the board. And there are some, I mean, you look at Ashok Leyland and Indescent, et cetera, where you've got active shareholders, uh, directors, who actually, but they do not manage the business. And then you have businesses that are managed by trust, you know, which are families, which they put their uh, ownership into a trust, and then they are actually managed as passive investors. So, the thing is, where there are owner managers, it is really important for the families to have a view on what is the purpose of their business. Why have they created this business? Is it to create an everlasting business, which is what the patriarch or the founder has created? Is it because they want to create they, they think of family first, that they want to create employment for the members of the family and also uh, give them uh, wealth and purposeful uh, uh, activity, you know, in terms of their presence. Or third, is the family, which will, uh, the business, which is always their largest source of wealth, just wealth maximization. And they really need to answer this question, why is this business being created? Is it, and once they answer that question, that's only after that, that you can actually have a view on how the family can actually manage that business. Because it's very interesting, every company, we just had a discussion on the audit committee, right? Every company is mandated to have a board of directors, is mandated to have a CEO. Most of them will have a management committee. The board will have many subcommittees. The family is not mandated to have anything. The family has love and affection. The family works on fairness. But actually, if the family is in business, it really becomes an issue. Because can you work on love and affection and fairness, while on the other hand, you have a company which has shareholders often, which require results? How do you actually manage these competing interests? What is the structure by which you can objectively intervene on issues which are naturally sensitive? And if, especially in countries like India and, and you know, much of the East, which individualism was not the, the core value. You know, you, you really used to look at the family and on society uh, as having real constraints on individualism you know, quite distinct from uh, the West. So it is a very interesting phenomenon which hasn't really been studied with Asian eyes in the same way. Some of the uh, best writers on family business are all from the West, which had individualism, you know, as, as their uh, underpinning, not social responsibility and family, uh, 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 you know, cohesion and also respect, and all the, you know, the kinds of things which people expect 
in, in, in the East are different. You know, I, I, the place I come from, I would touch the feet of elders. You know, my elder brother, I'll touch his feet. Which is, uh, you know, if you just are in a family business and you're both operating, that becomes a big constraint. So, if family businesses are to continue, firstly, their performance in Asia is better than the performance of non-family businesses. This is little known, but their shareholder returns are almost three percentage points better if you take them as a group over the last 10 years, last 15 years, and last, you know, actually if you go over a long period of time, there is some problems in data because, you know, the families have evolved and so it's not always easy to capture. But certainly in the last 15 years, which is counterintuitive because liberalization took place, there's been more competition and yet their performance has been better. The other thing which is very interesting is that most people say it's shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves, you know, in third generation family businesses fail. But I always find that comparison a little unfair because most normal companies also fail in that period. And in fact, today, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, the, the entire group of standard and poor 32,000 companies, a third of them exit every five years. You know, so the rate of mortality, despite individuals living longer, companies are living shorter and shorter. And there is a little bit of a dichotomy there. So if <coughs> families have to actually uh, want to continue without conflict, then they really need to address a few things. First, the purpose. Then you need to look at the nature of the business, the nature of the family, and the nature of the ecosystem. So the nature of the ecosystem, by that I mean the simple things. Is the capital market sufficient? Can you sell a business? Can you uh, create a trust where you can actually park the wealth? You know, those kind of structures which allow the family more choices. Because I was yesterday in London for a meeting with a family business where the founder, and he's running a $18 billion business, said, you know, I can't resign. I can't resign. You all can resign. He was telling his top management. But how can I resign? You know, so if the share price is coming down, everyone is holding my neck, not your neck. You know, and it was really a, quite a vivid description of what he was facing. Because he said, I have to answer everyone. You know, I mean, and, and it's my name which comes out on the cover, saying he is, he is destroying value. So I don't like that. And the second is, you know, most people look at families, at least in the West, in terms of generation, first generation, second generation, third generation. Actually, in India, we really need to look at the family in the context of the family. One child, two children, three children, you know, do they have, uh, is it a conglomerate where there are four businesses which are easy to split, or it's one business which is harder to split? Are they going to stay together because of insecurity, because one or two of the siblings feel they are not really good and they want the protection of the family? Or actually, do they want to split because they have different interests and they want to develop the business differently? So, actually, it is quite interesting that this, the bespoke nature of the family, irrespective of the generation, is looked at, rather than, you know, simplistically saying in which generation are you. Because that's when the, the, the conflicts start to arise. And then you need to look at the business. You know, is it a very, very fast moving, high tech business where talent of a certain kind is required and that talent wants returns which are, uh, you know, related to related. themselves and they actually want to capture the value that they are giving to the business. And so they don't want to work for a family business where they're getting longer employment, but they are not capturing all the value themselves. So these elements are very important for families to think about as they choose the businesses that they create, as they figure out the model by which they continue. And if they don't, then they will fight and instantly destroy value. And the last thing I will say in my opening comments is that even when you create structures in family, you know, what is the family constitution? How should the family behave? What are also the me me method in which you exercise your, your, uh, your decision rights? 
how do you actually express yourself as an owner and, and actually hold managers to account who are your brothers and sisters. The most important thing and 70% almost of the conflicts that occur, occur not because of right and wrong, but because of hurt feelings. Because somebody feels disrespected. Somebody says something which hurts somebody. And then if this is allowed to carry on, there is no recovery. Because people feel insulted, they feel lack of trust, and then there are these deep fault lines that get created, which you cannot unwind. Oh so the most important, the most important question if you are ever trying to mediate in a family dispute is not to ask who is right or wrong, but to ask, how are you feeling? Why are you feeling hurt? Why are you feeling hurt? And you to tell the other person so that the person apologizes. No, no, I didn't want to hurt your feeling, but I think what you're doing is not fair. That's a good discussion. But if you start the right wrong without first unco un uncovering the feelings, you will never make progress. KK, now I'll pass it on to you. <laughs> KK, all of you came together, yes. you were all working professionals, doing very well. Mm. And then suddenly it occurred to you that we need to get together and build this company. So while you might not have been members of the same family by birth, in a sense you brought that unity that family members have, have. and then created a business out of it. One of the things that I observed when I looked at your company was all of you who were there, the founders who were still in the company, you had complementary strengths. That's right. And it all added up to one great unit. So because you had complementary strengths, you didn't feel the urge, I suspect, to step on each other's toes. Correct. Which normally happens when a bunch of guys get together and say, we want to run a business, and then there could be differences in opinion. But I think they respected the fact that you had some strengths, somebody else had some strengths and therefore you built on that. So drawing on what uh, Janmaji said, are there elements from the way Indian families, Indian business families have set up business that have impacted when you look back at the way that your company grew with a bunch of people born in different families but coming together as a family. But before I bring you in one lighthearted comment uh, mm -hmm. on what you said, I thought in one sentence you captured the problems that many families face. When you bend down to touch the feet of your elder, are you pulling his leg also in the process? <laughs> <laughs> KK, hold your seats. No, that's a very interesting observation. And in a way, if you think it, I think the culture of being in a family, I think helps when you really form the teams. But I think as entrepreneurs, there's an advantage because you're not dictated by what was given to you. Because in a family business, I think it's given that only these people can work together. Whereas the big advantage in an entrepreneur team is, if you realize that, like you said, diversity is important. Each person brings in a certain strength and character into enhancing the quality of the decision. But I think there needs to be a mutual respect, understanding what the other person brings in. Now, and in a way, that brings in the alignment of the team. More than anything else, I think the point that Janmajaya made on the purpose of the business, mm. I think there needs to be a shared alignment in terms of why is it we are getting into the business. Because so, again, when you start a business, I many times tell entrepreneurs, don't look at starting a business as a lottery. Because a lot of them look at it as lottery as a slot machine, saying that I'll start this business, I'll take it to a certain valuation and then get out. But there must be a real pull factor for you to start it. And again, there were three things which at Mindtree, it still is sort of resonates in my mind. We said we want to build a very admired and memorable company. Because admiration and sort of always being admired for what you do was a very, very strong driving factor. We said we must create a lot more shared wealth. That was another drive. The third was we said we must give back to society. So those three premises were some things which built or aligned a, a diverse group together, which in a way helped. But beyond that, once you even have the team, I think it's important to establish the principles of how you'll do business 
very early on. And again, in the mind trick context, even before we launched the company or did our first business, we had a set of principles which we agreed on, which everybody, I wouldn't say signed in blood, but we still have those uh, big worksheets on which we did that. Simple things like saying, at no point in time, any of the blood relatives of us will work in the company. It's a philosophy, a principle, so that we don't sort of uh, inculcate things. Uh, things like all founders will sort of exit the company, even from the board or executive position, when we turned 70. Because we just didn't want, uh, we wanted the institution to grow, not necessarily keep sort of influencing it. Important in terms of decision-making approach. What happened? Because it's not that I think we never had a dispute or anything. But then an approach which everybody had agreed upon saying that, hey, this is the decision-making approach if we have a dissonance. And the last thing which is very important, I think, treating investors' money as our own, because that's a very philosophical principle to the extent till almost nine years into the company, all of us used to travel only economy class. Because uh, we said, we're still not making money even though it was overseas trips and working in a company or a large company using others' money. So that's a very important philosophy which then comes not just to the founding team, but the next set of uh, leaders. Uh, and some elements, because many times I tell entrepreneurs with whom I work with, I think all of you are focusing on your idea how to get customers, but elements of how you want to be transparent to your investors, what sort of governance principles you want to do, has to be embedded within the organization at a very early stage. You can't suddenly sort of bring it once you've gone to a scale. And important in terms of what sort of culture, what sort of leadership which you need to bring in, I think those become very, very important. Uh, so one, I think bringing in diversity and aligning people along a purpose, but then somebody orchestrating saying that actually the team is diverse. Uh, so that, Thankfully, I think because me and Shivrato started on the idea almost a year before we started it, we were able to bring that diversity, bring in that element. And laying out the principles of how you'll do business, so that everybody is sort of, there's no question of debating that later. I think it's a set principle. I think those certainly help. One of the thoughts that uh, your comments triggered is you must have mutual respect, but reverence could be undermining business. Yes. If you're reverential to somebody. So, Janmajay, in a family business, if the guy that set it up, the patriarch, is still around very active, the fact that it's a traditional family, the next generation, is not just respectful but reverential. He is my father, therefore he's right. That fathers don't have a right to commit mistakes is almost a sort of given in very reverential kind of relationships. Does that undermine business, especially if the father overstays his welcome on the company, doesn't go away when he turns 70, Correct. he is still around. Uh, the next generation, not particularly young, when the father is 70, he must be maybe mid-40s type, uh, armed with a qualification from overseas, and he doesn't want to be the next Prince Charles. So he wants to get into that seat quickly. So uh, how, how does this business of reverence get into it? So before I come to reverence, whenever we look at a family business, there are eight typical conflicts. Okay. F uh, old man not going. This, this frightens me. Eight of them. Eight. And eight, yet so eight, many eight, families eight. are in business. Okay. Old man not going. Brothers ah. fight. Son-in-law problem. Ah. What is the deal with daughters? Ah. Eldest incompetent, meaning, you know, there are these typical uh, eight issues <laughs> which tend to come up okay. on, a, on a regular pattern. So the law of primogeniture doesn't work. <laughs> law of and the oldest have the right to destroy the business doesn't so, work. Okay. So, you know, Plato yeah. and Aristotle had said yeah. that even if it doesn't work, it keeps wealth together. Okay. This democracy is not so great. The issue with founders, if they are the founders who create uh, businesses is that often they are superman entrepreneurs. They are really just remarkable people who have a gut which is unbelievable. Just now I'm working with two of them, one in, in Bangkok. In 2000, his revenues were $100 million. Today, his revenues are $14.4 billion. Wow. 
Now, in 19 years, you know, that means you will always be slightly obsessive. Mm. I mean, you will be slightly eccentric. You cannot be totally normal. No. I mean, it is not possible <laughs> to be completely, uh, you know, suddenly in the night he'll get a brainwave and ring up every one of his team to say, we are not meeting at 9, let's meet at 7 in the morning. Which, if you're an advisor, is really inconvenient. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> suddenly the timing is changed. But they are, they are just, uh, Absolutely. you know, slight, just yeah. driven to a level which is not totally normal, to be quite honest <laughs> with you. So, w they have a lot of latitude and leeway. They can decide to separate things between the children. They can decide up to what time they will be there. They can, you know, th and the, the, the family tends to react to them. The typical Quite often, the typical problem with very strong founders is that their grandchildren are better than their children. No. Mm. Because they are so overpoweringly present that their children grow up with a little bit of almost a slight complex. You know mm. what I mean? And mm. So unless they are very well thought through, it, they should stay longer rather than shorter, because then the grandchildren also start coming in. They are more irreverent. They are, they are not so taken up by the, by the founder, you know. Uh, currently, the, this problem is most acute in China, mm. because it's the first generation, founder, CEOs, you know, they are all over the place, and they are completely impossible to deal with. You know, I mean, <laughs> when you have to deal with a founder, CEO, it is tough, because their gut is good, they smell, you know, they understand issues. And many times, many times, their children don't turn out, uh, you know, to be as... As good as... Uh, as as uh, well. Mm. They, they do sometimes, and those families you would know of, you know, mm. I mean, where, where it happens. Or you will have an early grandchild who learns very quickly and picks it up, and then gets trained quite well. Now, all, also, I will tell you, over training has its pluses and minuses. You know, I mean, when you go and do an MBA at Harvard and come back, you know, you lose a little bit of your nose and uh, grounded earthiness, uh, which, is, uh, which is also pretty useful. But uh, <laughs> the one truth about all families is each family is different. And if ever we start easily drawing parallels, drawing parallels. then uh, you know, we, we are likely to make a mistake. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that the grandchild is trusted more than the child. And that, of course, even if you move out of the context of business, it's happening in the rest of in the non-business relationships. Because I personally, uh, I have four grandchildren. and. Uh, I think grandparenting is rights without responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> Another bunch of guys, your middle generation has a responsibility, you have rights. Right. And, and therefore that relationship is an easier relationship, sure. less, less friction in that relationship. But moving away to another aspect, I mean, if you look at a patriarch, strong guy in the business, everybody is looking to him to see how it runs. And there's a strong matriarch sitting in the house, not involved in the business, hmm. but wanting to know whether the business is run in a manner that is consistent with the interests of all the family members, some of whom might not be in business. Hmm. So she's sitting there and saying that, look, I, do, I am not asking you how you run your business. All I want to know is, are you running it in a manner that does not destroy wealth and that creates wealth for these bunch of characters whom I am looking after at home. Have you come across these? So, uh, there are, if you look yeah. at it, yeah. divorce yeah. has very low impact on family businesses. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, sons have a big impact. Uh, brothers fighting have a big impact. But there are very few places where the, the couple is running the business. You have a few founders who are doing that, but even there, divorce doesn't uh, uh, upset the business, you know, because one or the other is a, a, a bigger driver. 
the norms that get created and how you manage, I mean, you know, the, the one thing I will tell you, family businesses are not great for diversity. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there is one place where you have active discrimination against women, it is, you know, <laughs> in, in family businesses that I have actually experienced. You know, I mean... And, and this is in India and outside? Uh, in India, I mean, okay. East okay. Is, is terrible. And okay. actually, to be honest, even Germany now, it's, you know, if the last 20, 30 years, it's becoming more common. But otherwise, this has been not great for diversity, mm -hmm. I will tell you. You know, and people, they, they believe, you know, what is, what is the family line? This is, many family constitutions will have family line, outsiders, insiders, you know, what, who can be given the business, who cannot, what is the role of son-in-laws, can they be brought in, can they not, you know, I mean, there is a, it's actually quite interesting. But, of course, disharmony amongst spouses can be a cause of major conflict, and of, often this is on the size of the car, the size of the aeroplane, etc., that one has versus the other, this can be very disorienting. Mm -hmm. So many family constitutions will say, you can have a 1,200 square feet house, you can, you know, education and healthcare will be paid for, but you, you know, you <laughs> will be paid coffee. this salary, you know, and at this age, your salary will go up. It, it's quite remarkable, as far away from, performance management systems, <laughs> as, you can, as you can see. No, uh, interesting, it triggers a thought. You know, many years ago, I was talking to a bunch of young district magistrates. Mm. And there is, in the district, a tension between the district magistrate and the senior superintendent of police. And that has to be a harmonious relationship, otherwise everyone else takes Correct. advantage. And so I was asked this, it's interesting you say, differences between daughters-in-law, etc. And one bright young guy asked me, so what is the uh, magical formula to fix this? I, and my response was, it was not a thinking response, instinctive, but now that I think about it, maybe I was right. I stumbled on that. I said, see that your wife and the senior SP's wife have a good relationship. Things will be hunky-dory. <laughs> if, if there is a problem between both of them, you're going to spend a lot of time. Your bandwidth is going to be uh, available for business is going to be narrow because you're fixing these problems. Because you don't want two prima donnas, the district is a small place uh, working around in that area. Succession planning. A, a father who's decided, I've set this up, I've grown this. I'm 60 today. I will be 65 in a few years' time. My children have learned the business. They're running different parts of it. I think one of them should succeed. They seem to be good guys. And to add a twist to this, and this is a real-life situation, the eldest child is a daughter, and the son-in-law is in that business, and he is older to the two sons. So you have a son-in-law heading some businesses, two sons. The daughter is bright, the daughters in law are bright, but for some reason they're out of the business for whatever reason. How, and he has to now think in terms of succession. Is that a good case of bringing an outsider, say, I can't decide among you, so I'll get in a guy <laughs> from outside? Or how, how do you find families deciding succession? So, I will yeah. tell you differently and bespoke. Yes. Yeah. So, one of the most uh, I can't name the person, but one of the most uh, recently interesting conversations I had was with one of the patriarchs who has retired, you know, so to speak, but has created this succession, you know, which is quite interesting. The ownership, <coughs> voting rights, and succession are all separate, meaning in terms of owner managers. And yet, for the family to split, will be almost impossible. You know, I mean, the, 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 the way he has created this trust, there needs to be 100% unanimity, etc. So, you know, I said, why are you doing this? You're really making it hard for the next generation. I mean, do you really want to do this? And, you know, in this lovely office, he leaned back a bit. And he said, why am I doing this? I guess because I can. 
<laughs> I said, I can't believe that. He said, you know, I want the family to stay together. Okay. And these guys, if they are trying to do that, they are going to suffer. So that's, that's what it is. So I said, from the grave, you'll be watching that. He said, I will not be watching that, but they will be experiencing it. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, this is the this is the nature of these these, uh, of these businesses. Yeah. The person can do it. It's his. I mean, you know, the, it's his business. I mean, and he can sit well with it. I mean, uh, Ram Prashad Goenka. When Harsh Goenka was abroad, he came back and suddenly when he landed in Bombay, the businesses had been split. Yeah. <laughs> he was told, "Hey, this is yours and this is it." And he said. You didn't wait for me to come. He said, no, if you were here, it would have been a bit more difficult. Okay. <laughs> so when you were on holiday, I just decided to split the business. I said, no, it's his business. He split it. So I asked Harsh, what did you do? He said, well, fate had not planned. That was my business. I took it on from there. So I'm just saying that there, there are no, you can do succession well or badly, can be judged with only one metric, mm. which is, is there conflict or not? If there is no conflict, great succession. Whether it is fair, unfair, who cares? If there is no conflict, it's good succession. If there is conflict, it's bad succession. That's all. I mean, whether you, you keep them both together, you, you separate the businesses, you throw somebody out, you give it to somebody, all that, as long as it, the business continues, is fine. If you allow conflict, and if you allow conflict to go to courts, hmm. well, then you live with it. <laughs> then you, you have created the problem and you're going to suffer with it. Then you find, spend time in the courts yeah. and also run business once in a while. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You, you get a little spare time outside of course exactly. running your business. Exactly. Keki, in your kind of situation, when you have a number of partners, and I'm not talking about your company, mm. but there is one other Bangalore based company that mm. I have in mind as I ask you this question. Mm. A bunch of people came together, created a great business. But for some reason, they decided, I will run this for a few years, then this guy will run it, then the next guy. Do you think at every point of time when you're contemplating who is going to be the next CEO, you should also look at the universe outside and say, because Absolutely. you might have agreed, but then you went and listed the company. Correct. Now you don't have, you have one sixth of the share holding or one seventh among the, mm. what are called the promoters, of course. That's one category that SEBI will finally deal with, make it history. <laughs> That's what we hear. And the earlier it happens, the better. But uh, in that kind of situation, do you say, okay, we decided this long years ago when we got together, after me, him, after him, the next guy, mm. and all the while you're shutting out talent from the outside and you have 80 plus percentage of non-promoter shareholding. Is that a good thing? How does this get addressed? No, I would think that's certainly not the right thing. Because again, I forgot to mention one thing, saying that yeah. one of the key things we said was that there is no question of a musical chair in terms of who runs the company. Uh, yeah. So even when I sort of succeeded a show, it was something where our board was involved. In fact, there were three of us who were almost of a similar age, so the board made a choice. Even in the context of my succession, because that's something which he said that beyond 60, ideally you shouldn't hold an executive position. So it got initiated almost a year and a half back. Interestingly, I'm just sharing this in this group, that the board met with some external candidates, in fact, made an offer to somebody external. He didn't join. And obviously, my successor was incidentally another co-founder, but he was not the next in line. He was probably the youngest of the uh, yes. So he sort of uh, thing. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important because we're talking about Ghana's. Uh, how does somebody who doesn't have an interest in saying that, hey, this is a musical chair, which uh, is a right? Because sometimes founders tend to think, it's my entitlement to become a CEO, rather than saying, can I be the best person to deliver the best value to shareholders? Because now I'm responsible. I'm, a, in a sense, a stakeholder, and I play a stewardship role. Rather than, yes, I could be an owner manager, but I have a larger role of being a steward. And I think the board needs to play a very key role in actively getting engaged in that succession planning. And sometimes, I think, culturally, we don't take those hard decisions. Here, I'm just talking in terms of many other entrepreneurial teams I've met. In the recent past, I've had two instances where we had to tell a founder CEO saying that, you know what, I think you've done a great job. Nobody is questioning your ownership. Now, please step aside and we'll get another CEO. 
And that becomes a very, very difficult conversation because he believes it's his entitlement. Yes. Mm. I got the idea, I put the team together, I have to be the CEO. So what is wrong? If two years we have not met numbers, nothing is wrong. It will come. And hope cannot be a thing for creating value. It has to be through decisive action, which <coughs> I think the board and the owners need to do that, the stakeholders. You know, uh, picking up uh, one of your thoughts, you said the role of the board. Mm. I was thinking of a situation where, say, in your, like your company, when somebody has to move out or decides to move out from the CEO's role, and there are, let's say, three of you still around young enough to take that, why not the independent directors sit together and say, which among the three of you is better? I'm assuming you're not looking at the outside world. This is your universal choice. Mm. Why not leave it to the independent directors? They've all seen you up close. Correct. They've seen you in boardrooms. Leave it to them to decide who should be the next seat. No, interestingly, my succession happened like that. Okay. In an off-site in Goa, the uh -huh. independent directors came out with saying, I think okay. this is the best candidate. Okay, that's interesting. Yes. We have 16 minutes on the clock. Okay. Questions from the audience. If you have a question, please stand up and Kiran. Uh, Kiran doesn't have to name himself, we know him, but otherwise, <laughs> yeah. no, no. Yeah. Thank you. Chandra, uh, a question to you on your experience or your thoughts on it. You know, you gave examples of succession planning and so on, which is in the same company. Uh, more and more, I am seeing a trend, and you, you, you may contradict this or no, there, but it's happening in some cases at least, where the next generation doesn't want to work in that company, they want to set up their own. Now, what happens in situations where that next generation is a different company, which is not doing well, because as you rightly said, the second generation is not so good, it's the third generation which is good again. So this guy started a company because he wants to start his own, or she wants to start her own, and it's not doing well. And then the temptation for the patriarch is to somehow support that company and funnel funds there. Have you come across such a situation, and how would you deal with that kind of issue within the family? Because the family feels very strongly. It's a separate company, and so there are problems. And then you get into tricky areas about money from here, going there, in what form, so. So, I, I would just uh, segregate two issues, integrity and what they do. Quite often, uh, uh, you know, patriarchs will support their children's business. You know, sometimes they'd have created this uh, money which is going into the holding company or some structure from which they'll send it, which is perfectly fine. Others, you know, may not follow the uh, rule of law, which is not so fine, you know what I mean? And, but that is a matter of integrity. So, in fact, if anyone wants to do business with a family business, you know, whether it's a private equity fund or it's a joint venture partner, if they just look at the, uh, you know, I find many times funds just do not know how to think about investing in family businesses. Because they just look at the balance sheet, which is the most useless thing to look at. You don't know where <laughs> decisions are made. You don't know what succession is. You don't know, you know, who has power and who doesn't. You know, I mean, in, in terms of... And whether there's a remote <clears throat> control in the family. Of course. Yeah. And many times there will be on, on <laughs> some of these issues. So you need to understand that. And it is a very likely that people will support their children's floundering businesses. Sometimes even brothers will support uh, their family businesses are adhering to what they felt their parents may have wanted. How they do it, uh, you know, varies. You know, I mean, some do it well, some do it badly. I mean, also, just let us remember, very unlike today, where if two brothers are doing business, and, you know, you have a holding company, so the profits are going up at a certain rate, etc., but you are doing it, one is hugely successful. One is hugely unsuccessful. And the honor of being successful was your, your reward. You both are being paid the same, etc., and the family is going from one generation to the next. Now, of course, many brothers say to hell with it. Here, I'm yeah, creating I'm all the value, and this guy is getting the benefit. Where is, uh, how does this work? And I had gone for this family business network. There is a French family, 13th generation. I don't know, thousand people, you know, in now that uh, group of, you know, this uh, consortium that manages. One of their principles is, if any business is doing badly, they will applaud that leader. 
So he will say, I have really done badly. So everyone will clap. I mean, you know, whatever it is. You know, the family stays together. And they say, why do you want my family business to do well or badly? We want to stay together. That's our purpose. And so it doesn't matter. So business is incidental. Uh, yeah. It's keeping the, the family, family together. together. Okay. So, okay. Uh, and they have this annual general body meeting. And these are hopefully not listed entities. Uh, some of yeah. their subsidiaries are. <laughs> yeah. Some of their subsidiaries are, okay. but not okay. some of these companies. Somebody in the back put up the hand. Yeah. yeah. Please identify yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm Sandeep. Uh, I represent a foreign uh, financial services business. Uh, one of the things that I observe is uh, the family run businesses have an empire building kind of mentality, while when they're listed, companies need value creation. And in the empire building, for them, Maslow's hierarchy has been exceeded far far back in time. So in some sense, future wealth is not as, as material as the ego building. Uh, are you seeing some change in that happening, uh, especially Janmeja? And of course, Mr. Damodar, is there a change in mindset that's happening among the family-run businesses or it's still similar? Yeah, you know, I, I would say we have to be careful with generalizations. They just don't capture the, the mosaic of family businesses that are operating. I, I, so the one biggest shock I have got as I have gone into research is that I have lost all certitude. You know, when you started, <laughs> I had a lot of confidence about what family businesses were. As I have done more research, I have lost all confidence because I can find a counter example to every example every, that I would start, Every hypothesis, uh, you have. hypothesis I would have. So it, you learn a lot of humility, you know, with this. So I can't say that they have ego, that they are founder mentality. I will say that founders by nature, these superman entrepreneurs, are not the, you should not marry one of them. You know, <laughs> it, it, you will not have a good life, you know, because they will be <laughs> you know, completely you become obsessed. become the second with, spouse. <laughs> yeah, you will always be the second spouse, there is no doubt. I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, in, um, like you said, Germany also there are a lot of family owned businesses and all that. In, uh, do, are they listed? See, what happens in India is we do have, uh, you know, founders or promoters who start the company. They have invested a certain amount. And then when they want to expand, they really want to grow um, uh, and diversify. They end up, you know, either borrowing uh, or borrowing from the banks and setting up other businesses. They don't put more equity into the, the initial business that they've started. And then they get leveraged or they get they get listed and they get uh, shareholders funds. So that has, you know, also led to some problems. The, but in, uh, say for instance, somewhere is reading that, uh, you know, many family-owned businesses, I think in Germany, for instance, they are not listed, isn't it? So again, the middle stand is the middle stand and they don't like growing that much. Yeah. So, the, you know, they are between the 300 million to the 800 uh, million, you know, euro kind of a thing, they're below billion dollars, you know, and the thing is that there are many listed companies where you will find people are actually raising the family stake. Now, if you really look at what happened post-liberalization in India, most family businesses increased their stake in their, in their business. Mm -hmm. They did not reduce it. You will see most, you know, at the time, if we go back to 1993-94, holdings used to be 15 to 20 percent. Now they are all inching close, to, you know, have gone much above that. You know, no, I mean, no, in, no. Uh, because they felt that they could be taken over. No, that and, is because of the fear of, of course. Taking over. But that's perfectly fine. No, that's you know, the, the thing that we have which is the biggest issue that I find, which is a problem in India, is that there is a certain narrative which is negative about families. Mm -hmm. And this is a false narrative. Because for every 30% which is negative, you know, who are the, 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 have the highest market share of NPAs and all that, there is yeah. an equivalent which have always repaid their loans. Yeah, sure. And the banks are lending to the family name. They don't even care about the balance sheet um, because they know that this is safe. So, and, but the family businesses have done one thing, abysmally poorly. They have not been able to address this narrative at all. Mm. And actually, if, 
you know, because they are, they don't think about themselves as this community of uh, family business. Family business. So they don't, I mean, and everyone feels the other guy is the bad guy, you know what I mean, and not them. And that doesn't do much because the narrative then turns negative. No, but I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I have heard even some uh, founders and promoters saying that, you know, we are better than professional managers because we have skin in the game. We think long term and therefore they survive better and they do better also, like you said. Even in India, I think some studies have shown that. Uh, in that context, what do you think about the quota committee recommendation about the chairman CEO position being there? Separate and the chairman should be independent. Honestly, it is, it is, this, I think, uh, should be a question that Mr. Damodaran, you know, he has is, answered uh, it today before you. <laughs> so you, you tell us whether you really think that uh, this is a I kind have of a, to maybe say, not necessarily, the jury is not out on that. Yeah. All governance structures are subservient to the people in those structures. Mm -hmm. And so I find that our dependence on structures is completely falsely placed. Because if with motivated management, there is no structure that can survive. So you have good behavior and you have bad behavior. Bad behavior. You have, and if you have good behavior, it will work. And if you have bad behavior, it won't work. And so I just you know, feel that we are going through some of this. Hopefully, it increases transparency. Hopefully, you have better conformity. But trust me, people will th be thinking very carefully who the chairman is. So you will have had a chairman and a managing director who are different. But the chairman selection would have been done with so much care, or the managing director uh, uh, would have been done with so much care that in essence, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. No, I think when you look forward, what is going to happen is a lot of promoters post 1st April will become vice chairman and managing director and they will put a venerable old person uh, who is beyond, I mean, who cannot bite, might not bark, who put that kind of guy to lead the board and then you are safe. You have complied with the law, you run the company. You are the face of the company. No one knows who your <laughs> chair is, nor does it matter. But there is a chair other than you, and that, that's enough for the law. Okay. Kiki, what do you think about this? No, I think it's important. But again, as long as, like Janmaja said, there's a purpose in terms of appreciating that there is a larger stakeholder thing which you serve, I think just by being related, I don't think, uh, because I think family business also, many of them, have got that ethos and a certain thing to distinguish, which is why I think you can't say that it's just that they go by the relationship. Many times they also tend to be objective in terms of assessment and sometimes even removing people who are not performing. So I think it cannot be taken as a judgment just because there's a relationship. It is not something which will work. But the fundamental premise between splitting those roles I think is very strong. So I think that needs to be done without taking a perception or thing saying that, hey, because of the relationship, it won't function in the way in which it was designed. We have time for one brief, precise question. No time for a statement or a comment, but time for a short question. Sir? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Acha, yes. You are. I am Ramakrishna and this yes. question is to KK. KK, in Mindtree, when all of you came together with varying senioritys, experience and public profiles, did you have some sort of a charter, some sort of a governance uh, or code of conduct that enabled you to stay together for so long and then plan out the other transitions? No, what I talked about, some of the principles of the business, I think was in a way decided even much before the company was launched. And that, I think, really served as a great thing. Because in times of doubt, I think we'll go back to that uh, white sheet where those five, six principles are sort of laid out. Thank you very much. That has been most informative for me, at least, and I hope some of the thoughts as they shared uh, will be of use to you as you contemplate setting up family businesses. You need to know what building blocks and to use uh, Kiran Majumdar's uh, expression of the morning, what guardrails and guidelines you need to, to ensure that you are in a safe zone. Join me in thanking my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jim.
Yes. And we have, have our tokens. Uh, Mr. Damodran will do us the honours. I Thank hope, you, I hope oh. it is oh, reasonable. As close to. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it captures the scholarliness of it. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, would you like to have the Thank concluding you, remarks now? Yes, yes. You might notice from the program that we have budgeted 15 minutes for a winding up session. I don't need 15 minutes. I need much less than that. I know that you've been a very patient audience from yesterday morning. And uh, when Arjuna Ranatunga led Sri Lanka to victory and the Australians looking at his physique, said, this guy can't play cricket. How is he a World Cup winning captain? He made a very interesting comment, and that's relevant to most of what you heard. He said, it's not the size of your stomach that's important. It's a fire in the belly that's important. So I think that is what keeps entrepreneurs going. And uh, I know that several of you have fire in the belly. We have something outside to extinguish it. Thank you very much, and see you. See you next November. I think the dates are 26 and 27. Is that right? Same venue, November 26, 27, 2020. I hope most of you will be here. And we will get equally provocative and interesting speakers next time round as we've had this time. Thank you very much. And thank you. Jeff. Ladies and gentlemen, do remember to collect all your belongings before you leave. We have lunch outside. Please join us now. Thank you.